Hey, how's it going, dude? So first, today I'm going to show you how you can diagnose problems with a car that cranks but does not start. All right, so when this happens, the first thing I usually do is to check for spark. So I grab my spark tester, or if you don't have a spark tester, you can just grab a spare spark plug. Then you remove one of your spark plug wires, and then you install your spark plug at the end of it. Next, you can ground your spark plug by using some jumper cables. So you put one end on this end, on the base of your spark plug, and the other end on the negative side of your battery. Next, we're gonna get in our car, turn the engine, and look and see whether we're getting spark or not. All right, now before we start the diagnostic procedure for no spark, it's a very good idea to go to your uh, underhood and also inside the cabin fuse box and check every single fuse and relay that's related to your ignition system. And you usually have a diagram on the back of the cover that tells you which fuse and relay is for what. All right, so now we're just gonna work our way back from the spark plug to see which component is not doing its job. Now, if you have an older car like this 95 Toyota Camry, you're gonna have a distributor before your spark plug, which is what we're gonna check next. But if you have a newer car like this 2004 Saturn Ion, you won't have a distributor, and before your spoke plug, you would have your ignition coil pack. So that's what you would need to check, and we'll get to that in a second. Now the easiest way to check for to see whether your distributor is doing its job or not is to the process of elimination, which is basically you follow that back, see this, uh, this wire that goes to your uh, ignition coil, and then we're gonna remove this wire and check to see whether we're getting spark coming out of this ignition coil. If we get spark coming out of this, but it's not reaching our spark plugs, we're gonna replace the distributor, cap and rotor, plus all the spark plug wires. But if we're not getting spark coming out of this, then we're gonna follow that further back. There we go. And the way I'm gonna check this ignition coil is to get a screwdriver, put it in here where the spark would come out, and then grab another screwdriver and grind it out like this. Then I'm gonna get someone to crank the engine and get the screwdriver close to this one without touching it and see whether I get a spark here or not. All right, so as you saw, we're getting spark at our ignition coil, but that spark is not making it to our spark plugs. And that's because there's a problem probably with either the cable that goes from our ignition coil to our distributor or the distributor cap and rotor itself. Usually when you buy the distributor cap and rotor, it's a good idea to replace all these spark plug wires and that wire that supplies the spark from your ignition coil. But if you're uh, trying to save a buck, you can test this wire. And uh, if you get spark at the end of the wire, but not out of the distributor, then you can just replace the distributor cap and rotor. But I recommend you just replace the wires with the distributor cap and rotor all at the same time. All right, now let's say you don't get spark out of your ignition coil either. All right, so on an older setup like this, you have one ignition coil that supplies spark for all your four cylinders. And that ignition coil is gonna get one wire that has 12 volts and another wire that's the signal wire. So here's a look at our connector for this ignition coil. It's got two wires. One of these should have 12 volts with the key in the on position with engine off. But sometimes you have to crank the engine to get the 12 uh, constant voltage here. And as you can see, the second one, this one, we're getting a voltage here and this is going to be this white and red wire on this ignition coil. But the proper way to check the signal wire is with the connector attached to our ignition coil because that signal that comes from our uh, the constant travels through the ignition coil and out the other wire which goes to the your ignition control module or your car's computer and then your car's computer turns off that uh, that signal and that's what causes for you to have spark at your ignition coil so this has to be attached in order for that voltage to travel through your ignition coil okay and then we're going to back probe this wire all right, as you can see, I back probed that wire and attached it to my test light with these alligator clamps. Now I'm just gonna crank the engine. If, if this test light blinks, that means this ignition coil should produce a spark. And if it's not, it means it's bad. All right, so as you saw, we got our test light to blink. It was actually really fast. So it might, on camera, it might look like it was just flickering, but it was actually blinking. So that means that we're getting both signal and constant voltage to our ignition coil. And if you don't have spark coming out of that ignition coil, that's gonna mean that that ignition coil is bad. Now on most modern cars, you're gonna have what's called an ignition coil pack, which looks like this for a four cylinder. Now on this one, in reality, you have two ignition coils. You got one supplying spark for cylinder number two and three, and you got another one supplying a spark to cylinder number one and four. And of course you test these the same way. You first check to see on the connector where you're getting constant voltage supplied to this ignition coil, and then you test the other two to make sure you're getting a signal. Also on some ignition coil packs, you might have an extra pin here for ground. So you wanna check on that too. 
And of course, if you have a six cylinder or an eight cylinder, you're gonna have another one of these. So you would have three of these for a six cylinder and an extra one if you have an eight cylinder car. Now, if you're not getting 12 volts supplied to your ignition coil, you, know, you wanna get your hand on some wiring diagrams for your car and follow that wire back. Make sure you check on all the wiring, all the connectors, any fuses or relays that are in the way and you make sure all of them are working properly. Now, on the other hand, if you're not getting signal to your ignition coil, what you wanna do is also check the wiring and the connectors, but What's responsible for timing the signal that's sent from your course computer to your ignition coil is gonna be your crankshaft position sensor. Now your crankshaft position sensor looks like this. There are two main type of sensors. You gotta have one sensor that has three pins or three wires. These sensors will require 12 volts to work. The other one has only two pins or two wires. These are uh, voltage producing sensors and they don't need any amount of power or voltage to work. And these usually live right above your uh, crankshaft gear and as your crankshaft gear turns when you crank the engine these teeth that are on your gear set off a signal from your crankshaft position sensor to your car's computer then that's how your car's computer knows when to signal your ignition coils to fire off a spark so you'll usually need to find the connector or the wiring harness for your crankshaft position sensor and then get your multimeter and check to see whether it's putting out any voltage or not now on some cars if you have a tachometer you can just look at the needle on there and if it moves then that means you're getting signal from your crankshaft position sensor but that's not always the case on some cars that needle is not going to move unless the engine is cranking past a certain uh, speed this car being one of them because i know it has a good crankshaft position sensor but still that needle didn't move also something that i forgot to mention in the beginning of this video the first thing you should do is to check your car's computer for any fault codes a lot of times that will lead you to where the problem is. But uh, also I've done some other videos regarding the ignition system on both the distributor system and also a distributorless system, plus a video on how you can uh, test the uh, like crankshaft or camshaft position sensor. And I'll put a link to those videos on this side of the screen. There'll also be links in the description box for you to check as well. All right, so let's say your engine does get spark. If that's the case, what you wanna check next is to see whether it's getting fuel as well or not. Now a quick way to see whether the fuel is your problem or not is to use some starting fluid. Basically, all you have to do is to find a way to spray some starting fluid for a few seconds inside your air intake hose. You either remove a sensor or undo this from the air filter box, spray some of this in there, and then if you can start the car and it runs for a couple seconds, then that means you have a problem with fuel. Either it's fuel pressure, that's your problem, or your fuel injectors are not working properly. All right, so if fuel is your problem, the first thing you need to check on is to see whether you have pressure or not in your fuel system. So on most cars, either on the fuel rail, right above your fuel injectors or the piping that goes to it, you're gonna have a pressure port like this. And these are for connecting a pressure gauge like this, which will tell you exactly how many PSI of pressure you have in this fuel line. And that's with the key on, engine off. You should also cycle the key on off a couple of times to make sure you build up enough pressure in your fuel rail. And as you can see, we got about 50 PSI of pressure in this fuel rail which is about spec for this car. Now a very crude way of telling whether you have fuel pressure in that line or not is to basically get a bunch of rag, put it around that pressure fitting, and then with the key in the on position, you get a screwdriver and you press that little Schrader valve in. You're gonna have a lot of fuel coming at you at about 50 PSI, but again, if you don't have a pressure gauge, that's just basically gonna tell you you have some pressure in the fuel line. All right, so if you have no pressure in your fuel rail, that usually points to a problem with your fuel pump or its circuit. But if you have low pressure, uh, then that potentially could mean you either have a weak fuel pump or a clog in your fuel lines, which uh, could be a, due to a partially clogged fuel filter. Now, before we go over to your fuel pump, you should take your time and check every fuse and relay again in your fuse box. Once again, look in the cover to find the fuse and the relay related to your fuel pump and check them. And if your fuse and relay check out fine, then it's time to go over to your fuel pump, get a gain access to the connector to it, and check the connector for ground and power. But make sure you watch this video I've made on how to diagnose a fuel pump properly, because it's important you, you do it correctly, because if you don't, then you're gonna have a lot, spend a lot of time and money uh, replacing a fuel pump, all the while that's not your problem, and it's something else. Now if your engine runs when you space starting fluid and you have fuel pressure, then the main culprit is gonna be your fuel injectors. Now it's highly unlikely that more than one of your fuel injectors has failed, therefore your engine is not starting, but what's more likely is that the system that's responsible for turning these fuel injectors on and off at the right time is not working properly. So first you'll need to find your fuel injectors and then remove one of the connectors that goes to them. 
So each fuel injector is going to have two wires. One of them is going to supply it with constant voltage. The other one is going to be the ground wire. And your car's computer is going to use the ground side to switch the fuel injector on and off. So after removing the connector to one of the injectors, you want to get your multimeter and test both wires and make sure you're getting constant voltage. It's either going to be, uh, I think, 5 or 6 volts or 12 volts on most injectors supplied to that to each injector. And you can find that out by your multimeter. You should get that at constantly with the key on, engine off. Now, if you're not getting constant voltage to your fuel injectors, there's a very good chance there's a problem with your uh, connectors, the wiring, or one of the relays or the fuses that are on the path of that wire that supplies voltage to your fuel injectors. Now, as far as checking the ground side and make sure it's pulsing when, the, when you're cranking the engine, you can use a multimeter or a test light. But the correct tool for this is called the Noit light. You can rent these at your local auto parts store. They basically, you're gonna get a set, Noit lights for different makes and models, and that plugs into your, uh, the harness for your fuel injector. And when you're cranking the engine, that Noit light is gonna blink, telling you you both have uh, uh, constant voltage and the ground side is also being switched on and off. Therefore, there's no problem with the circuit that's going to your fuel injector. Now, if you find that you are getting constant voltage to your fuel injectors, but the ground side is not being switched on and off by your car's computer, here are the main culprits. All right, now on some cars, when your crankshaft position sensor goes bad, it not only cuts off a spark, but also your injector pulse is turned off as well. But on some cars, you need to check your camshaft position sensor as well. Again, this sensor works similar to the crankshaft position sensor, but it's located right behind or next to your camshaft gear. And on some cars, if that sensor goes bad, then that's your uh, injector pulse is, not, is gonna be turned off. Therefore, you're not gonna be able to start your car. Also, next, your throttle position sensor could also cause a no injector pulse condition. As some of you may know, whenever you want to disable your fuel system, you press your gas pedal all the way to the floor, and then when you crank the engine, your engine is not going to turn on, it's just going to crank because your fuel system is disabled. Well, the sensor that's responsible for that is your throttle position sensor. That's the sensor that tells your car's computer you had wide open throttle, and if for some reason your throttle position sensor has failed, and it's sending that voltage to your car's computer, which is telling it the throttle plate is all the way open. Well, you've disabled your fuel system, you're not gonna get an injector pulse, and that's why you're not able to start your car. Now also on some cars, a bad MAF sensor can also cause you to not have an injector pulse. A lot of times though, a bad MAF sensor will cause your car to run very poorly, but not completely keep it away from starting. But on other cars, a bad MAF sensor can cause your car not to have injector pulse, therefore not start. Now if your car comes with a MAF sensor, it's usually going to go either on the fuel filter box or on this air hose that goes to your intake manifold from your air filter box. Now if you suspect the problem with that, something that sometimes helps is to simply remove the connector from this sensor. If that's the problem which is causing you to not have injector pulse, uh, a lot of times by removing the connector, your car's computer goes into default mode and bases its uh, calculation on the air fuel mixture on some uh, preset parameters and therefore you're able to start your car. All right, so if you find that you're getting, you're getting both spark and fuel, but you're still not able to start your car, then the main remaining culprit is gonna be a mechanical problem with your engine. And the main culprit with the mechanical problem with your engine is gonna be a lack of compression. Now, one way to see whether compression is your problem or not is to simply listen to the engine. An engine with low compression is gonna turn over very quickly. All right, so in the video that you just saw, that was an engine that had the timing belt on it was torn. Therefore, the valves were not closing. They were just simply staying open. Therefore, there was no compression in the combustion chamber and the engine was turning over very rapidly. Now, a torn timing belt is only one of the reasons why you can have low compression. An overheated engine with a blown head gasket is also not going to have compression. An engine that has problems with the piston rings or even an engine that's the, where the timing belt has slipped, they're all not going to have compression, therefore are going to keep your car away from starting. Now a definitive way to see whether you have compression in your engine or not is to simply do a compression test. Basically you would remove your spark plugs and install this uh, pressure gauge into each spark plug hole and crank the engine and this is going to tell you exactly how many psi of pressure you have in each cylinder. Now if you find that you have both spark, fuel and you have compression in each cylinder but you're still unable to start your car, well in that case uh, there's either a problem in your intake, maybe something is clog clogging it up, keeping air from entering your engine, or a problem in your exhaust where something is clogging up the exhaust pipe 
and in turn keeping exhaust fumes from exiting your combustion chamber. And if that's the case, the main culprit is going to be your catalytic converter, uh, either breaking up and then clogging your exhaust pipe or getting really, really dirty and uh, clogging up and not allowing enough exhaust fumes to exit your engine. But this doesn't happen overnight. There's going to be other signs leading up to it being this bad where it keeps your engine from starting, but it's definitely a possibility. And that's going to be it for this video. I'm sure I forgot some stuff that could cause a crank no start condition, but uh, this should be a very good beginning for people trying to diagnose this problem on their own. So yeah, I hope that you liked this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe if you want to see more like it. But also, again, check out these related videos I'll put up on this side of the screen for you to click on. There will also be links in the description box down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.